Okay. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. This is part two of uh, preparing for the unfamiliar. I decided to extend the talk. Uh, this mouse is tripping. Okay. So I was building this picture and I ended off with Srinya Sargadat Maharaj in part one. <clears throat> but really the whole intention is, like what's the point of me speaking, is that we're evolutionary creatures. We have a certain way <clears throat> that we have built our civilization. We have an ability to consider the future and there was a time where human beings discovered the future. We were all living in the here and now, just present, and it was an ability. It was a sort of advancement to see time, or even the concept of it. To notice the arrow of time was an advancement. Now, the issue is, we, were, we wanted to look for truth too early as a species, And so we were looking for a definition. We were looking for meaning. <clears throat> so in a changing system, people are trying to find meaning to their life. They're trying to find different ways of living. But the issue is that the language, the immediate imagery of the world and its meaning it has to be taken to its root and as mind notices body the inner realms become, synony become similar to the outer realm so when you close your eyes and you watch your inner realms, the attention has no choice because of the lack of visual input <clears throat> to seek the habit of visualization internally. When you close your eyes, you see a subtle light frame, subtle light frame of that, uh, whatever you see, and then it's echo as if it, it, you, are, you can notice, it's as if light echoes behind our eyes when we close our eyes. When we see something and we close our eyes, that image is echoing. And the echoes get faint and faint and faint. So after a while, you got to open your eyes again to look at the image to revisualize re it. So, Sri Nisargadat Maharaj, in the previous episode, he said three, I took away three very important points from what he said, that you need to wake up know yourself and be yourself <clears throat> and let us treat the advancement of civilization similar that we need to first wake up to a collective value then we need to know our place in the system to know ourselves in the system to know ourself to know yourself yourself is the system you are living in then to be yourself 
So the thing is, actually behaving violent and being like an animal is pretty normal. When you look at history, when you look at the past, you see a savageness in our ancestry. <clears throat> so violence is the norm. It is civility, observance, mindfulness. These are the factors that take you beyond just, just, just an animal. They say what separates the human being from an animal. Human beings are conscious of their mortality. Human beings have a sophisticated use of language. Human beings have a deeper amnesia than many other species. So what it really means is preparing for the p potential ways the world can move so far in our eyes. And not just the potential ways, the <clears throat> like it's pretty much how do you, what has happened when someone's explored it uncharted territory, they explore it and then they identify it. They paint it with the familiar. We went on the moon, we planted a flag. When the person goes to their inner realms, they don't want to come, empty, come back empty handed. This is at the beginning. When you don't know the nature of the inner realms, yet you're ideologically fascinated by it. From the mystical angle, the mirror of truth was shattered into many pieces. And every piece is reflecting the nature of the cosmic activity. It kind of feels like a toroidal universe, toroidal field-like universe, where in the sense that the edges of the universe are in spine, the center of the attention to the universe. The edge comes back into the center, like a spinning donut, you know? But the donut is spinning, you know? Not, the, not like like a toroidal field, you know. There was a point in my life where there was the... I had a very strange, sudden passion for the Andromeda galaxy. And that idea was so crucial because it was a freedom of there being more than what the person is doing going on. Back in the day, survival of the fittest, only an objective landscape was being processed by the intelligent being, by the intelligence of the being. Now there is a subjective landscape, not just an objective landscape. And this subjective landscape, the processing of it suggests how advanced something can be.
pretty much this creature that we are is oscillating between dimensions, dimensional views, views upon its dimension. That's what different states of mind are. And so because it is set in motion, really the only thing is that the only way is to climb up Mount Meru. We have to look at our dimension, our plane of existence, like we look at ourselves in the mirror. Human beings are not their thoughts. Thoughts are visiting, like an Airbnb, their minds. Thoughts occupy attention. The occupying of attention feels like living. But what is more crucial is the emergence of the brighter picture. You see, the whole psychology of the creature that we are is oscillating between the known and the unknown. When you realize this, pretty much binary morality of good and evil, all of this goes back to, the, to a cosmological point, that there is the light of the sun causing our, the world's visibility being like an on and off switch effect. So what that means is everything you see in human psychology is light and its absence, light and its absence, light and its absence, light and its absence, hope, despair, hope, despair, joy, suffering, joy, suffering, known, unknown. Do you see how what I mean that it's a rhythm? It's a movement. Therefore, the honor of the attention is non-dual. You can say that that's when you've high-fived your mind, when there is no mind to, uh, you know, high-five. You see, the same way that scientists would take an animal and cage it, and study the animal, and some people, scientists were like, some, not scientists, but ecologists, let's, zoologists, they would, they would do this, but they would suddenly see, like, it's as if the animal is not the animal, it's not the natural animal. So I feel that we are doing the same thing, where there is a cinema, there is a sort of internal uh, cinematic language, and this internal cinematic language, it can't be vocalized, but when we do, it's like an animal in a cage. That means when somebody says something, there is, there, is, there, is a, there is some part of it, there is life, but another angle of it, it is a, it is a, it is a framework upon the moment. We have caged the unknown in knowledge to realize that the unknown deserves to run into the unknown. That means the moment we consider an unknown self, suddenly life has an unknown person and the person doesn't know enough to fear. This, this I could say, I could say was the metaphysical, metaphys the allure of metaphysics, that it was you were not limited to just the physics. Because you see, regardless of how much of a rational or irrational person you are, because there is, a, there is, you can say, a dimension of emotions going on, emotions have to do with not just rationality or irrationality, it has to do with how the person is being a person to themselves. That is the main justification of behavior when I see you know, when you see somebody get offended or when you get to see somebody get angry or when you see somebody become happy, what that means is it was like suddenly the right key fit, uh, fit into the right keyhole and it, and that moment it activated in that manner. For me, if you look at reality on a design level, you can build it way ahead of its time. But if you limit what's right and wrong to, to build, it is it is becomes like an image-based game. <clears throat> So 
So by the realization that all psychology, all duality is light and its absence and we kind of adapted ourselves to it, I could say that the reaction to um, light and its absence is civilization. The whole point. The algorithm is in the same way. When there's hope, we all run as if like the world, light, sun has come, the world is visible, we can do stuff. Suddenly the sun goes away, oh no. This is why when someone does something wrong, you, you know, even in Star Wars, it was like the guy's gone to the dark side. How you have comprehended yourself as a natural part of this world <clears throat> suggests how content you will be with the unknown. Now, a lot of sages on this planet take us to the unknown, but the unknown is really attention with no location. Because if it had a location, it'd be known. It'd be a factor of knowing. So what it would imply is that after civilization is united, after there is an advanced effort, after there is a sort of renaissance and revolution in the design of the type of civilization we, were, we want, you know, after we have 8 billion ch uh, human beings um, going towards uh, tr uh, the designer's table and trying to build a new prototype of a better civilization, like that should be the only assignment for children. Because here's the thing, the value of actions, a lot of human actions on this planet are very meaningless. That means a lot of people work, but they are not control of where their energy goes. It's as if you just go to a vending machine, you give energy and you get cash back. You know, that's how in, in some sense a lot of people are enduring their lives, you know. And when the workstation is limited, then the person uh, is limited. You know what it is? It's the sign of uh, how would I say it? I'm just saying think as if you were a person who took care of yourself. You had no problems, no, no issues, everything was in complete harmony with the idea of yourself. You were done. That means every day you would wake up, you had seen, you had noticed the self. You know? You had noticed the value of the self. Then you, the next thing is, is no longer an idea, language based or idea based or truth story based kind of thing. The next thing is an experiential relationship with the unknown where you're starting to notice that you have been identifying with the content of attention, now you can identify with the whole attention itself. <clears throat> because it's this life really how free will comes across, you're thrown in a chess game of your own uh, perception. That means on some level, like I, I look at psychology in, in modern times, you know, psychologists and, for example, the whole notion of the, uh, what they have of uh, counseling and whatnot. And there's one view on, like, the psychologist should be, the person comes into the psychologist, the psychologist should get angry and be like, why are you here? What's wrong with you? You know, like, <laughs> what, on one manner, I have this thing. It's as if, like, what has, what has made you suffer so much, you know? And, but on another angle, I'm like, yeah, the psychologist should be like, you know, the uh, the through a through a sort of I see it through the king archetype and the queen archetype. Do you know that means all embracing or in some sense like very uh, uh, dismissive? You can say <clears throat> because the whole point of it is is what is moving the person. If you were someone who somebody some other other something else other than your free will moved you, let us say. If you were someone like that, then any problem you had, because you're not moving yourself, you can't do anything. But if all, regardless of any type of ideological landscape, there's an attention to the presence of the being, that you realize you exist, then through a certain 
capa capability of experience, language, and all the subjective landscapes and linguistic simulation open up. an advanced civilization with advanced individuals that can work with the collective in known and unknown ways. Because that's the whole point of us being able to communicate. You know how like you can look at the design of a cup and you can kind of see like how it's made to exist in a moment where water is poured into it. So it's kind of like you see the existence of the human ability to communicate and you wonder about what's going to happen to communication. And there is a view of it moving beyond our vocal cords, becoming on a telepathic level, you know, which the word telepathy, it's really archaic. And it's archaic not in a good way even, do you know? <clears throat> because it, it, it's, it's, it's a bit, the word is, a I don't know, but anyways, I could say the notion that it's eventually going to a communication not between an object with another object, but with a mind with another mind. You see, people can be afraid of like the notion of spirits, you know, but when you're talking to a person, technically if you entertain the idea of a spirit, when you talk to another person, you're talking to a spirit that's embodied. Do you see what I mean? Like it's, it's like you don't fear the familiar, you fear the unfamiliar. So Mr. Ruthin is saying either the evolution of communication is an individual communicating with the collective mind or an individual becoming a collective mind or the individual remembering they are the collective mind. Remembrance is natural, becoming is most likely digital. So in this life, whoever you are, if you wake up and you observe what is happening as you in the moment and you know yourself and then you accept that and you realize it is okay and then you be yourself that means you live that is enough or I could say that was enough <laughs> That now there has to emerge some sort of neo honor. Let's call it neo honorism, where it's just the attempt to find the new thing that must be honored, the new event that is going to be important. Because what is going on is creatures are waking up, they have value systems, they're responding to stimulus, the environment, the, their ecosystem. And what's happening is they're making decisions and they're going through an event. Now, the whole point of an advanced civilization is like, why are all these individuals having their own separate events, which some of them may be helpful, some of them may not, and why not build a system that it's like every energetic effort is contributing to the collective development, but the personal life is, can go any way. That means you could do, imagine like, it, it, you know what it is? I, I have this hobby of wondering about future technologies. And I wondered about, uh, I had a, like, 
my middle school, I, I could say it was, um, there was a lot of staircases. There was a lot of levels of stairs you had to go up. And after a while, I got this idea, this innovative idea, where I was like, oh my God, if imagine all those staircases could slowly go down and they could create some sort of charge for some sort of power. Imagine all those kids every day walking up those stairs, they could have created a sort of uh, endless energy and power for the whole school. So that's my point, that it's like it's something that is uh, succeeding, yet it is indirect. That means regardless of if the person is happy or sad, every step they take on that staircase is contributing to the power of the building. You see what I mean? So that's what I mean. We build a civilization where it's, it's like it, we make it further and further away extinction. That means we, know, we locate the extinction possibilities and we start building a circular walls around it more and more, layers, levels, le ways that it makes, it makes it complex for human beings to dismiss the value of their civilization and the effort of it that's taken 4 billion years. It took, it's, you know what it is? It's as if it, it's like the cosmos started writing a story and the story hasn't finished and it's been four billion years in the making. Unconscious creaturehood is meaningless. The more you hide from the world, the less meaning it needs to have. The more you are noticing the cries of the guy in mind, then, then it's as if you realize there is a priority system. That in life we're conditioned to run after the extreme, not realizing that there is something missing. What that means is, imagine we had an honor of an advanced civilization that could tolerate such levels of advanced communication that if an extraterrestrial landed, we had so many techniques and methods and systems of having that extraterrestrial uh, share its knowledge regardless of its evolutionary ability. I am saying we are on a rock in the middle of nowhere and now more than ever, the mightiest performance of the human species is being called for. For the moment one person said it, the universe heard it. You know, I've had certain shamanic moments, very, this is very personal, but I'll share it. Because the day, there's nothing more personal than the moment happening. In my silence, the inner dialogue, which we consider as thinking, neurologists speak about it that way. I don't just consider it as dialogue. I say that there is a speaker, there's a self, and there's a world. Just like how in, your, in front of your eyes, there's a self, objective self, and an objective world. Behind your eyes, I'm saying that the inner realms, there's a subjective self, subjective self and a subjective world. The subjective world is the future. The subjective self is the past. That means somebody asks you who you are, you got to look back at your past. Somebody says what world you're in, you're like a better world than this. You know? <laughs> and that's the thing. If we realize that in the future, everything we think that is right and wrong now, there would be so much more advanced levels of it, we would be fearless now. There would be nothing to lose on a rock in the middle of nowhere. That is the glory of the attempt for an advanced civilization. That it can get mystically silent sometimes. And it can sometimes get very loud. As there was a moment in my life where I had a whole room of family members angry. <laughs> and it, it, was a, it was a sort of anger that it was the it was as if like i was i was surrounded and it was a situation where it was so intense too many people were talking at the same time that i literally sat down on the ground it was hilarious 
It was as if like all these people gathered around to talk to me and I just sat down on the ground. <laughs> because it was too much. It, the intensity, it, there was an overwhelmment. There was like there's no possibility for an efficient strategy. I got to relocate. Find a new angle. Because, if it, because just because a person can't solve a problem doesn't mean a problem can't be solved. It just means you don't know how to solve it yet. You know? That's, that's why you need to be a fool when you are getting acquainted with something new. <laughs> so things that are new to me, I am like, yeah, like very humble. You know, things that I'm very familiar with to a certain level of utility, I, I, it's very easy to say that which you are. That's the power of being before doing anything in this life. When you really understand its value, that you're not, we're not here to be in a, the succession of an ideological program. We are here to realize that man has may die, but the world has not. As far as I'm concerned, the word world looks, seems immortal to me. You know. <laughs> What does that mean, immortality? It means you were created, but you can't be destroyed. But eternity means you were never created, and you can never be destroyed. And so what is the human psyche doing? You know, isn't it, isn't it nice to um, uh, make a cup of tea and one... one And one evening, just stare at the sky, you know, because if you want life to be just good, you cannot go on the battlefield. If you just want to be bad, you cannot go into this battlefield. That's the point of the advanced communicator. We are witnessing ourselves beyond duality. Because I don't know if, if people in this life have wondered what is moving them or what is moving or what is even defining movement. And we have feared it. We have called it philosophy, metaphysics, and children are limited to just imaginations that are being reduced to the material. But why is the imagination there? That's the question. If we were all meant to live as rational people, why are we irrational? Why is that behavioral algorithm going? So do we want to make rationality an ultimate filter, or do we want to say, all right, let's treat it as an artist civilization? A civilization where there is freedom, yet there is control. Because there's no point of having a Ferrari you can't drive. <laughs> a man can dream. <laughs> You know, Martin Luther King had a dream, you know, uh, I mean, Joe Brand, sorry, I had a dream. <laughs> of course, I'm being playful, you know. There's no greater dream for me than, a ca than the archaic revival of the castle in the sky. Civilization 2.0, I feel, is the, uh, this, wor this idea I've been working on for some time now. This is, I feel, the most efficient strategy to bypass extinction. But let's say even if we do, that means it's like, what question would an immortal being have? So that's the thing. I think in this life, we're not here to just be rational people. We are here to express we are here to be an expression of our experience. Now, what's, gone, what's happened is language is a new technology. Because language is new. I mean, think about the history of like how old the universe is and how much there was just silence, just silent creatures moving on this planet. And suddenly, one of the creatures got up and was like, Hey, you know, hey, Billy, what you, how's it going? You know, <laughs> you know with an Italian accent. Right? <laughs> So you see, it's one of those things where we, 
we must now care for the emergence of the most efficient global empire. And when I say empire, the emperor is the vision of the future generations. I mean, think about it. Technically, saying that the future generations are emperors, if there's an emperor in the future generation, for example, you know, <laughs> that means it's as if the future is always the the like the, there's a steering wheel held by that was held by the past and there was a steering wheel that's being held now and there's a steering wheel that will be held in ways that we cannot even fathom do you know i'm just sharing these talks and i'm just waiting to see what the future generations are going to say in what ways the school of athens is, may be evoked because it's no longer about just uh, living like an animal when you see more than an animal. And this brings us to the ultimate question. Where does freedom come from? That means, imagine right now, every, every 8 billion human beings were teleported to a parallel dimension where there was no mistakes and it was a utopic paradise of, on Earth. Okay? But we would, our psychologies, would we be able to live in that utopia? We would see no. The mind declares itself into manifestation. That means if you think about like any act, there is a be there's a beginning, middle, and end. And so when one thinks about the mind, and I and I'm telling you it's an event. That's how the mind is being studied. It's an event. Something's going on. <laughs> Because we identify with thought, we can't notice the inner realms. Because we can't notice the inner realms, or even if we go into it, a lot of people want to grab pictures, you know? The, what happens is that the inner realms is the antenna. It's like waiting for the signal to be received. So for me, the way the inner realms, it's not the phenomena of the mind that's like imagination has its place. What I'm saying, it's not that Im the imagery is fascinating. It's what's moving the imagery in the moment that is life's roar. We have to build a civilization that lions deserve. And who, in this world where we are all like temporary candles, who cares for the glow, for this candle glow where the light may go out? Do you know, for me, all my whole life, it was like, yeah, there was an individual kind of personal value then it felt like the civilization's potential was like this candle flame where the wind was about to blow away and you know it's that it's that moment where man fell you know it's as if this is the human side of the uh, the countercultural view to the monotheistic tradition that if the creator is very forgiving why couldn't the creator forgive Adam, or forgive the early man. Why was it that God only became forgiving after we fell? And I wondered about this for a while. Why is it that it's like God is, is, like, is like the source of love on earth, but when we were in heaven, we were being scolded? You know what I mean? I was <laughs> so so there's, that's the notion. And you realize... It's the first duality. You ha it's like we, need to, we needed to make a mistake to know that there's mistakes are possible. You, know? and you can say it was the extension of the, the dimensions. So for me, this is pretty much the stories of the realm. It, it's as if it was like one cake, then it was divided into two pieces. 
you know? <laughs> That's it pretty much, guys. That's the metaphor. You know, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> There is something I would say, a skill I, I, I feel it's the most crucial skill in life. Doesn't matter if you're the, you know, uh, a princess or, you know, an orphan boy. It doesn't matter who you are. It is similar to someone going into a mine and someone trying to find a crystal or someone trying to find not treasure i don't want to bring treasure because the connotations of that are too egoic but but i want to say it's as if someone looking for a crystal like an excellent miner doing its job and the miner in that situation when i say miner like so, those people go find crystals like rare crystals or whatever i don't know what you mineralogists or whatever <clears throat> So that person is going there, and you see, when they feel they've, or they are onto something, there comes this inspiration of following it. You know? When, I, when in my inner realms, I see an efficient strategy, instant implementation, instant implementation. I'm telling you, when you see efficiency, release, release it. Don't hold power. It's, we're not designed as creatures to hold it. We're designed to, in some sense, the power to move through us. And in some sense, it's, uh, it's, here's the thing. Power was never meant to uh, uh, be wielded. Power was the wielder. That means the one, the prime movement or the soul of the moment, as some traditions say. You know, I found it very, it was strange, you know, it was something I came across, mythology. I noticed that there were gods that cried. And just the notion of a crying god, the notion of a creator that has noticed its own mistake, That true power, if it is there, what does it need to protect? What does it need to be if it is the ultimate? That is the question. It's, it's strange. So many people in this life, in this world, in history, human beings, they have ran after truth. They have ran after truth. They have ran after the ultimate state of salvation, not for a second wanting to look at what they're running towards. The implication of the ultimate for a dualistic mind is the only precious way I can say it's, it's the beyond, but a massive unknown event is awaiting everyone. And so how should we hold on to our knowledge? For how long should we mask our face in stories of right and wrong and this is it and that is it? And the thing about the silence is that it remains silent. The silent God, as if there are two gods, a God that is watching, that has never moved, and a God that is the everything in motion. As if God had two hemispheres to the psyche, to, a, to the ultimate psyche. As if the cosmos is a reflection of our design. And our design's evolution is the more. 
that there's something more. And for me, that was the sad thing, that when I saw the atheist and theist debate, I saw two siblings debate. Two, it was as if both were declaring something wasn't in a world that's changing. Something wasn't or something is. <clears throat> There's moments where anytime I'm in a discussion with someone and even in a conversation, suddenly it, 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 there's turbulence. Anytime I see that adding to the moment uh, makes the, in my perspective, I feel it reduces it, it reduces it, I remain as the silence. Learning to be the silence as much as the noise. Learning to find as much knowledge as in sound, in mouth noises. Do you see? All our knowledge is based on movement and noise. And silence and stillness was the absence of the knowledge, a.k.a. unknown. I think we found where the unknown lives, where the known doesn't. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, guys, that's all I can say. Even Bertrand Russell, this man of incredible materialistic perspective, he said one thing as an advice to future generations. He said a moral advice, be, tol be charitable and tolerant. That means it's not a perfect prototype of a civilization. It's something that's just so far it's come this way. Now you as the individual, as a member of this ad ad advanced civilization coming soon to theaters near <laughs> coming soon to planets near you, near you. <laughs> If we care for something better, there is a higher chance of manifesting it. Right now, the system is not the best, but that's why we see the update. And it's this weird situation where many human beings, we are way more civilized behind our eyes than in front of it. Our civility is intelligence in motion. So I would tell you this, there is a freedom that the world has to give you if you're in suffering or some like physical uh, storm, storm of elemental influence. Or I mean, really, in the inner realms, inaction is the only way the storms go. That means you could be any person in any state of mind, whether altered or not, or whatever way inspired, and you're going to notice that the less you do, the more it moves itself. The more you do, the more you're declaring meaning into that movement, so you, you see less. So I'm telling you, it's like the mystic was just letting the world move first before the self. The modern man is, is moving as first as the self, then the world. It's, it's considering the world. This is why we care for our immediate families, but we don't care for our grandchildren. We just care what's for what's in our sight, you know? But now it, it's, we, need the, we need to pilot this plane of existence consciously as 8 billion beings. We pilot it with a permission to comprehend communication in more advanced ways. And that was Carl Jung's genius. Carl Jung's genius was the, cre the term, the collective unconscious. That was the ultimate backup system to what happens to the aftermath of anarchy. The unknown is left. Violence is, a, is actually a sign of weakness. You know, Isaac Asimov says violence is the last refuge of the competent. That means everybody's mind is like this sophisticated 
biological technology and now we're living at a time where you, we have the faculty of speech so there literally needs to be no violence everybody should be able to communicate on a civil level if the person is violent they're either locked in their inner realms and that's dangerous when someone is locked in their inner realms like that I'll give you an example I um, now it's been it's been a while now past but um, when I was attending film school in um, uh, Toronto Film School in downtown Toronto, I was in this situation where every day I was smoking cigarettes like outside the door and watching the, th the thing. And um, of course, something to say is that a life without smoke is more clear. But anyways... I was wondering about human psychology. Every day I would watch the type of people. People who I noticed, all, all the people, all my classmates would walk past because they were too busy, um, in some sense, um, building an, a, 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 their narrative. Their co eco narrative, let's say. And there was a situation where I was just watching the people in downtown Toronto and it was as if like, yeah, look at people, you know, nice, you know, oh, look, she's pretty, you know, and then suddenly I would see savageness. So for me, society is a, a, a sort of playground and battlefield. For the wealthy, it's the playground. For the uh, poor and the defeated, for the successful, it's a playground. For the um, defeated, it is, it is in some sense a battlefield. And I remember looking at the psychology of the people. There was this guy who he, he acted as if he's holding a microphone and he would sing with a volume that you couldn't even hear. It was as if he was in his own world. Do you know? Every day this guy would sing for himself. And of course there was, there was chaos. You know what it was? It was as if like that person, like imagine Lord of the Rings, one of the soldiers getting hit by the leg of one of the giant elephants. You know, it was as if you, when you see defeat, you see some, you see like, you feel the, uh, the, the kind of aftermath vibe of war. What that means is as if the person lost their free will was uh, unauthorized by the realm, so they deteriorated. They broke down. That's the thing. That's why you, you have to realize the world, the civilization is not up to date. If you treat this world as like, assume if you at right now think you're a good person and act perfect, you're going to suffer. You know why? Because the system is imperfect. It's updating. You'll be like, why are people so evil? They're not evil. System is updating. Design blueprint is changing. And that would be an advanced level of communication where we're looking at design and we have a sophisticated attention to our objective realms, a mastery of attention in front of the eyes and a mastery of attention behind the eyes is the whole presence of the being. Each achievement, each honest care for the realm is rewarded by history. What that means is there is a sort of strange thing that it's not just people that have karma, it's like events have karma. It's as if the universe, imagine, has karma. <laughs> imagine the universe has a car. <laughs> just to ease down the imagery. <laughs> So anyways, guys, um, the whole notion is uh, we just like we have to update the alphabet either by creating new letters or, I don't know, completely re redesigning an alphabet. <clears throat> or we, in some sense, add dimensions to our way of living. Because what is happening to life? You have a conclusion about yourself. Then you go on experiencing different events and v v values are being taken away and added. So pretty much life feels like every experience the person goes through, it's like a dimension is being subtracted and a dimension is being added. Now the point of the free will is it can add dimensions 
and it can see potentials of dimensions. That's the whole point of it. It can add dimensions. Uh, what that means is you can be in an empty room, but then you can start building something, and that empty room is your studio. You know? <laughs> so meaning changes also in regards to effort. By the way, guys, um, anybody listening, feel free to ask any questions you have about any sort of uh, how, we, how you feel the civilization might open up to the notion of the archetype of the extraterrestrial. Because the only with communicating is like how the eyes of the species open. Proper discourse and dialogue. That's like a complete, efficient, advanced movement of communication. Flawless communication. We can reach there if we have the tolerance. Because life's value is not just insight. Everybody is in a sight. <laughs> So when you're aware of what's in your sight, you are you become an insightful person. You access the designer's vision, ego vision. So, anyways, guys, um, I'm gonna open it up to five minute Q and A, uh, and and encourage people to go listen to talks I have with the tag Civilization 2.0. The whole thing is, if what's not, if something isn't working, discontinue it. That means, for example, even if you're listening to my talks and something doesn't work for you, discontinue it. Because life significance is not just in one place. It's like before humans could speak, who, what was the teacher of the creature? The environment. That means all the teacher is the environment. Which ultimately means everybody is the pilot of their own eyes. I think this is a good thing for people to do. Maybe early in the morning while the sky is blue, they get a cup of tea or something. They go sit on their porch. They get a piece of paper and they wonder about what is important to them. What they care for. Like get a piece of paper and go in a silent moment, in an honest moment, and just write on a piece of paper, what do I care for as a being? And the, the, uh, the words you write down, the images you write down, you will look at those images and you'll be shocked how, much, how they are the programs for, that are your conditioning. That if you have an ability to uh, com uh, observe all those important factors, then also move beyond them, that is the advanced civilization becoming more and more instantaneous in expression. It's like, you know, this. what I'm saying, I could even say to a young kid, you know, the same way the young kid likes the teddy bear, you like the civilization. What you make important for yourself uh, becomes the GPS address of your life. And so we prepare for the unfamiliar by observing what we know to the brim. That means whatever you know as a being just accepted. And then you can notice the unknown. And that's where freedom is. That for a while nature was moving us, now we're moving ourselves and there's no greater purpose. It's an evolutionary honor. Cosmic honor. <laughs> so thanks for listening, guys. Blessings. I'll see you on Discord.